Let me welcome you to the second PSE Macro Day, in this case sponsored by the Banque de France, represented here by Olivier de Bond, my co-pilot, as we call it, in the chair, International Macroeconomics. I'm uh, very excited about the papers to come, so I don't want to have uh, uh, any uh, another welcome remark, but I want, do want to make two practical announcements. First of all, I want to alert you to a program change. Apparently, the, um, the French air traffic controllers decided that they are not going to control French air traffic today, uh, which has had a couple of consequences for our speakers. So we switched Martin's keynote with uh, Guido's paper. So don't be surprised uh, about that. It's online. It's updated online. We didn't print out the programs again. The second practical announcement is that we will be active, and you were active yesterday, but our audiovisual team, they asked us to kindly use the microphones because otherwise your questions get lost in the replay online, and that, of course, would be a shame. So there are plenty of microphones, and I will take one and... Uh, walk to you, up to you when you want to ask a question, just uh, raise your hand. And now I give the floor to Olivier for some few words and then we'll get started with Olivier. Just very, very, sh very short uh, welcome to, and a warm welcome to you to this uh, second day of the um, PSC Macro days. Um, on behalf of the Bank of France, we are happy to collaborate and co cooperate with, the, with PSC on this uh, partnership. This has been for, for quite a long time. It's a very uh, uh, fruitful. I mean, the, the topics of the day are very important for, for, our, for central banks, and uh, I, don't, I will not expand, I mean, not to be too long on that. I mean, of course, uh, Phillips curve, the, the, the shape of the Phillips curve, heterogeneity is important to us, and uh, Bank de France is dealing with this aspect of heterogeneity in its, uh, in its uh, surveys. Now we have a new surveys trying to measure uh, price expectations uh, from um, businesses. So uh, this showed that there's quite a strong heterogeneity there. And um, of course, uh, these are important issues. And of course, the, uh, the consequences of the COVID uh, and the effect on these, uh, and these factors are important to us. Just, uh, be, uh, just to say, uh, to be, uh, not to forget that we uh, have a great, uh, a big uh, research department at the Bank of France. And we are, of course, welcoming uh, academics to make presentations. So you're all welcome to, to come and present. Um, and also, an um, important issue that we are, will be present on the European job market. So if you have good students, please uh, um, advise them to, to apply. Thank you. And I, uh, I hope this, I mean, I wish you a very fruitful day of, of uh, presentation of papers and discussion. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. Thanks for showing up so early. Thanks to the organizers for including our paper on the program. My name is Oliver Pfeuti. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Mannheim. And this, this paper, which is titled The Behavioral Heterogeneous Age and New Keynesian Model, is joint work with Fabian, who's a PhD student in Berlin. And the paper is really motivated by some recent empirical findings about the transmission mechanisms of monetary policy. So there's more and more evidence that monetary policy affects household consumption mainly through changing people's incomes or through so-called indirect general equilibrium effects, whereas direct effects through changes in the interest rate, intertemporal substitution channels are probably less important. And it turns out that these indirect effects are such that they tend to amplify or to increase the effectiveness of conventional monetary policies. Announcements of future monetary policy actions or forward guidance, on the other hand, seem to have relatively weak effects in stimulating current economic activity. And what we have also observed over the last two decades or so is that many advanced economies have been stuck at the zero or the effective lower bound constraint on nominal interest rates but we did not see any large instabilities arise because of that. And the last point is kind of related to the first one. And you can uh, think of that point as micro moments matter. In particular, what has been highlighted in the literature is that high, uh, households with high marginal propensities to consume tend to be more exposed to aggregate income fluctuations, and that matters a lot for the monetary policy transmission mechanisms. So what we do in that paper is we provide a model with household heterogeneity that can account for all these four facts simultaneously. Well, what we do, or in, in, when we do that, we actually resolve a tension 
that has been highlighted in the literature in existing models, because it, it turns out that existing Hank models, when they account for facts one and four, so kind of the micro facts, if you want, they have a really hard time in matching the second and the, th and the third fact. And if, if they resolve the second and the third one, they have a hard time getting the first and the fourth one. So this is the tension we want to resolve. And how do we do this? Well, you might have guessed it from the title already. We have a model that where we kind of keep the new Keynesian core or the new Keynesian structure, but we allow for household heterogeneity, incomplete markets, and bounded rationality in the form of cognitive discounting. And th that then results in what we call the behavioral heterogeneous age new Keynesian model, or simply the behavioral Hank model. And we, the, the, the approach we take is kind of twofold. We start with a simple model where we have a limited heterogeneity setup and we restrict our attention to just two uh, types of households. And what that buys is it gives us a lot of analytical insights. We can derive all the results in closed form and get a good understanding of what is driving these results and why do the existing models fail. But of course, we need some really strong assumptions. Uh, we then relax these assumptions, move to a full Hank model, show that all the results carry over, so that they do not depend on these uh, limited heterogeneity assumptions. And uh, we can then also dig a little bit deeper, for example, the role of heterogeneity in the behavioral bias along the lines that we document empirically. And then the question arises, well, do we even care that we can account for these four facts? And therefore, we look at the policy implications of the model. And to give you a short preview of the policy implications, I will today focus on supply-driven inflationary pressures in the way that we're probably, probably observing now or have been observing over the last couple of months. In today's talk, I will focus on a negative TFP shock, but we can also look at cost post shocks and so on. But um, today will be about TFP shocks. Uh, well, what we find is that if monetary policy wants to stabilize inflation in that environment, it needs to act much more forcefully in the behavioral model compared to the rational model. And the reason is really that the rational model kind of fails at accounting for, these, for, for some of the facts, namely the for, forward guidance in the rational model is extremely powerful. So if monetary policy increases the interest rate a little bit and keeps it elevated for some time, then these expected higher interest rates in the future are extremely powerful in bringing inflation down already today. So this is kind of a, a contractionary forward guidance, if you want. But these channels are much less powerful in the behavioral model, so you have to do more right now. And because this applies in every period, you also have to do that more persistently. But when you do that, well, this has side effects in particular. And this is now why it's, why it's important to look at heterogeneity. Well, what we find is that, yes, you can stabilize inflation also in the behavioral Hank model. But you have these side effects. You increase consumption inequality substantially by redistributing through higher interest rates to wealthy households. And you also kind of have a larger fiscal footprint if you want. You increase the, the government debt um, quite substantially, especially in a kind of post-COVID world when the initial debt levels are already high. And then you also, of course, now when you have heterogeneous households, it, the, the tax system, for example, or the, or the fiscal regime, if you want, matters greatly. And we find that in the behavioral model, progressive taxes are relative to a less progressive, progressive tax is much more effective in bringing inequality down. And the reason is really because you have a higher tax burden that has to be repaid. So if you have progressive taxes, you, uh, you decrease inequality by taxing the rich. All right, so overall, the behavioral Hank model highlights that there's this strong trade-off between price stability, and as you will see, also kind of closing the output gap, so the, the standard monetary policy objectives, and the side effects, namely fiscal sustainability and inequality. So very briefly, in terms of the literature, uh, we contribute to what I think is a very exciting and, and kind of new emerging literature that combines insights from models with household heterogeneity with models uh, that deviate from the full information rational expectations uh, assumption. There are a few papers that uh, look at incomplete information, but they, yeah, so here we really have a kind of different focus and most closely to us is the Fadi and Werning paper, where they look at level K thinking, whereas we focus on cognitive discounting, and they only focus on resolving the forward guidance puzzle, and uh, where we focus on all these four facts. And in fact, they even turn off on purpose the four fun. And this is really where we come in and show, okay, how does it matter? Then how does this interact with the behavior frictions and so on? Yes, please. In terms of uh, transmissions, how is your framework different from the level K thinking framework? And um, you will see, so the level K thinking is about 
a behavior friction about the GE effects, right? That you, you're not sure how the GE effects work. Well, here the cognitive discounting applies basically to every um, kind of whenever there's an, an aggregate shock or something about your expectation in the future change, then you have this cognitive discount. You kind of discount everything, not just the GE effects, but also the direct effects, the project. And embedded, like, uh, discount level equation. It's an extra push for better Exactly, you will, you will see that, yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the talk will be such that I will first talk about the tractable model, the limited heterogeneity setup, and then show you the analytical results we get out of that, move then to the full kind of heterogeneity setup, and in the end talk about monetary and fiscal policy interactions. All right, so the model, yeah, the title already says it. It's a new Keynesian model. We have sticky prices, monopolistic competition, heterogeneous households, and cognitive discounting. Now the goal of the limited heterogeneity setup is really that we want to have analytical results, but we want to keep the model uh, insightful or interesting. So we will have heterogeneity in income exposure and MPCs to account for the four fact. We will have a precautionary savings motive and of course cognitive discounting. So there are two types of households. One is what we call an unconstrained household. You can think of this as a standard forward-looking intertemporally optimizing agent and we will have hand-to-mouth households and we have a share lambda of these hand-to-mouth households. Now as you will see on the next slide they differ in what kind of income they receive and in whether they participate in financial markets or not and what this gives us is heterogeneity in MPCs and income exposures. We will have an idiosyncratic risk in there so each individual household faces an idiosyncratic risk of switching her type from one period to the next. So each unconstrained household can become, with a certain probability, hand to mouth from one period to the next. And what this gives you is a precautionary savings motive, very similar to, for example, a standard Iagadi model. The, the unconstrained household will take that into account when making her uh, consumption savings decision. Now, in order to keep them all tractable, we will have to make some strong assumptions. One is that there will be full insurance within type. So each unconstrained household will consume and work the same amount. Every hand-to-mouth household will consume and work the same amount, but not necessarily across types. Across types, you, can only, uh, you only have these self-insurance. Um, notice, And we will focus on the zero liquidity equilibrium, again, for tractability reasons. We are going to relax these assumptions later on. All right, so households have a standard CRA utility function. They get utility from consumption, this utility from, from working. And the unconstrained households now, as I said, they have this idiosyncratic risk. So with probability 1 minus s, they will become hand to mouth. Later on, this will, be, this will be endogenous, right? Whether you will be at the boring constraint or not will be endogenous. For now, it's exogenous and happens with probability 1 minus s. And now, how does their budget constraint look like? It's quite standard. They consume, they can save in one period government bonds, and they can acquire the shares of the firm. So this is this Yoda T plus one are the shares of the firms that they buy at price nu. They receive labor income, they receive the income of, of the shares they own before, plus the after-tax dividend income, which is this D tilde, and they receive the interest rate income on their bonds, but only of a fraction small s. So this is really, this is, these are the bonds that were acquired from unconstrained households last period and that are still unconstrained. The hand-to-mouth households, they look quite different. They do not participate in financial markets. Again, here, this is exogenous. They do not save in bonds. They do not own any of the firms. And now, so we will allow for some transfers from the government in a lump sum fashion, just to, I will show you why we do this. This is not crucial for the results. And now you see the bonds, the bonds they get are these from the unconstrained households that are now hand to mouth. So this is where this type switching probability one minus S comes in and then we have one minus lambda of unconstrained households and then this is equally shared among all the hand to mouth households. This is why it's divided by lambda. So this is, this is just the bonds that are brought into the, the hand to mouth types from last period. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's, so later on in, in, the, in the model, this will be, you will have different productivities, and then you might end up at the borrowing constraint at some, if you get 
unlucky draws for quite some time, you might end up at the boring constraint. Here you can think of this, for example, as a shock to your discount factor, that you ex become extremely impatient, you want to borrow as much as possible, but there's a borrowing constraint at zero, so you don't do anything. You can think of this or a t as a taste shock that you just don't want to participate in too much. But here this is really just a reduced form of capturing this, I might become borrowing constraint in the future. Actually, I, have, I had a similar question. Mm -hmm. It's very basic. Uh, suppose I'm unconstrained at MT. Mm -hmm. uh, I become constrained at MT plus one, but mm -hmm. I have accumulated bonds. Yes. So what happens with the bonds? You will consume them immediately. Uh, you will share so them. I will consume all of them. Yes. <laughs> I can also repeat the question. <laughs> no. can I re so sh should I repeat the question? Uh, <laughs> so suppose I'm uh, unconstrained at time t and mm -hmm. become constrained at time t plus one. So if I'm uh, I have accumulated bonds, I mm -hmm. will consume all the bonds. If I have accumulated debts, should I no. not? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> no. What happens when you when you become constrained? you will consume all your bonds or you repay your debt. We're going to focus on the zero liquidity equilibrium, so they will be zero in equilibrium anyways, so it doesn't matter. But the assumption here from the budget constraint is you will consume everything. You will actually share them with all other hand-to-mouth households. This is really just for tractability reasons. Later on, this will not be the case. You will decide endogenously, optimally, whether you will consume the bonds or not. Yeah. All right. So yeah, they do not participate in financial markets well, and therefore they will have high MPCs, right? These households, they will basically just spend whatever income they have. Of course, there will be an adjustment in the labor supply, but they will have, these will be the high MPC households. So the rest of the model is, is quite standard. We have a standard firm side, new Keynesian setup with monopolistic competition, sticky prices, and so on. The government, for now, doesn't do much. What, what we have is we have these lump sum transfers and they tax the dividends and redistribute to hand-to-mouth households. As I said, we do not need this for any, of the, for any of the results qualitatively, but what it gives us is we can regulate how exposed how this, the different households are because profits are going to move the, in different ways than wages in that model here. And this also allows us to capture some of the existing models that are out there. Um, yeah, you will basically see that on the next slide. And the monetary policy for now, think of a simple Taylor rule and some monetary policy shocks, which for now is the only source of aggregate, income, uh, aggregate risk. All right, so then there are two key equations that come out of that, that model. The first one is the consumption of the hand-to-mouth households. And you can show that in, in equilibrium, in a linearized model, the consumption of hand-to-mouth households is a linear function of total output y hat. And this, this chi parameter, is now the income or the consumption sensitivity of hand-to-mouth households to aggregate income fluctuations. And it depends, it depends on this redistribution of tax tau d. So by changing tau d, we can, we can kind of regulate whether they will benefit more or less from aggregate income fluctuations. Well, if you go to the data, for example, Eau Claire or Christina Patterson have done, then what you find is that households with high MPCs their income and consumption is more sensitive to aggregate income fluctuations, so chi would be larger than one. And this is fact four from the first slide. So in, in, in terms of kind of the underlying parameters, this means that hand-to-mouth households benefit a lot from wage increases, but they are not that exposed to profit income. So what is happening? Let's think of an expansionary monetary policy shock. Now, the demand of the unconstrained households will go up, Labor demand will go up and wages will go up, but because of sticky prices, profits come down. The hand-to-mouth households will fully benefit from the wage increase, but they don't really suffer from the decrease in profits. So their income will move more than one for one with aggregate income, whereas the, the income of, of, of unconstrained households because of the decrease in profits actually increases by less than aggregate income. And this is what is captured by this chi larger than one. The second key equation is the Euler equation we have that the, the Euler equation of the unconstrained households is kind of standard. It depends on the, the expected consumption, but now this is where the precautionary savings motive comes in. So with the probability one minus S, the unconstrained household expects to be hand to mouth, and then it's the hand to mouth household's consumption that actually matters for her decision. And then we have uh, the real interest rate over there. Okay, so and now here you also see the bound, where the bounded rationality will come in. It will 
come in through the expectations you build about what will happen to my consumption, either if I become unconstrained or hand to mouth in the next period. And the way we model uh, the behavior or the, the bounded rationality follows GABEX, and we introduce cognitive discounting. So the idea is quite simple. Let's, let's say you have to form an expectation about some variable xt plus 1, so in one period ahead. Now what you can do is you can split this up into kind of a default or an anchor value, which is what we call xt. And that could be anything. For today's talk, it will be the steady state. And then you, and, and the deviation from it. So this is always true by definition of the deviation. Now the behavioral assumption is that you are rational or you anchor your expectations to that default value, but you cognitively discount the expected deviation from it. So we see we have there, we have the rational expectations operator, but this cognitive discounting parameter m bar is now showing up. And this m bar will, will be with, uh, is between zero and one, and the lower it is, the more you discount basically these expected deviations. One way to think about this is that you become, a, you, you, you get a, 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 a noisy signal about the future, and then, because it's noisy, you don't put full weight on it, and therefore you discount it. So which, or in economic terms, what it means is you underreact to news about the future. And there's quite a lot of evidence that their expectations, at least when you talk about macro news, uh, household expectations tend to underreact to these news. If we set M to 1, we are back to rational expectations. So rational expectations is really a special case of that behavioral assumption. However, as I said, when you go to the data, you find uh, evidence for underreaction somewhere in between 0 0.6, 0 0.85, it depends a little bit on what variable you're looking at and so on. So we will take for today's talk um, 0 0.85 as kind of the benchmark value, which is, uh, let's say, a, a mild deviation in a sense from rational expectations. Um, and it is also what Gabex uses in his representative H model, for example. All right, so let's see how this matters. and. To show you this, we now go to the aggregate IS equation. So we kind of combine the, the two key equations I showed you before. Uh, we aggregate the, the consumption of two household types and arrive at this IS equation, which looks at first sight super standard, right? You have total output is a function of expected output tomorrow and the real interest rate. And by the way, you can also think of this output as the output gap because potential output here would, would be constant. However, there are two new coefficients that show up and they will actually be crucial. The first one is the Psi F, and the second one the Psi C. So let's, let's look at them more closely. The Psi C tells you how sensitive output is to change in the real interest rate for a given expected output tomorrow, and it crucially depends on this income exposure of the high MPC households chi. And just mathematically speaking, if chi is larger than one, we get amplification. We get a Psi C that is larger than one. So output becomes more sensitive to changes in the real interest rate. So what is happening? And to think, to think uh, this through, let's consider a conventional monetary policy shock, fully transitory one-time decrease in the normal interest rate today. Unconstrained households, as in the standard model, they directly respond through an intertemporal substitution channel. They want to save less at lower interest rates. They want to consume more. And now through this channel we, we've seen before, this sky large than one, this the increase in consumption of unconstrained households will translate into a strong increase in the income of hand-to-mouth households, which is chi larger than one. And now because they have high MPCs, they will spend that money, and this gives a strong consumption increase, and this leads to this Psi C that is larger than one. So you, you see already that this is kind of these indirect effects through the redistribution towards hand-to-mouth households who will then spend everything. This is what really drives this amplification. So we have this amplification through general equilibrium effects, which is fact one. And in fact, we, we do a decomposition in the paper in general and partial equilibrium effects and find that about 70% is due to indirect effects, which is in line with larger Hank models, as for example, the kaplan mol vialante paper. Whereas in the representative agent model, either behavioral or rational, it would be something like 3%, which is not what we observe in the data. Okay, so this will be fact one. Now, let's, let's move to the other coefficient, the Psi F, and how will that matter? Well, the Psi F, for example, uh, first of all, kind of now depends on the interaction of the behavioral friction, the M bar, and the precautionary savings dynamics. So what you see here in, in orange 
we have this type switching probability one minus s. This is really comes in through this precautionary savings motive, and then the chi shows up again because if you become hand to mouth, what will matter for your consumption is how exposed you will be as a hand to mouth household. So you really see now where they kind of interact. And if you would have a standard kind of tank model, then this this uh, part here would just be zero. So qualitatively, nothing will be unchanged, but this here brings us actually much closer to, to the quantitative mo model later on, because there we will have these precautionary savings <coughs> motives as well. All right, so now... Why did the M bar not show up in the pi, whatever, psi C? Yeah, this is an, by assumption. This um, follows Gabex, that the assumption is that they observe real interest rates perfectly. We do it in the appendix, and actually, it does not matter for the for the amplification of a conventional shock because you know, the, if it's a one-time shock, the the expectation does not ma does not change. But it would matter here. We would actually get so to resolve kind of the four guidance puzzle and stability at the low bound. The conditions would be even even further relaxed. So this this assumption actually kind of goes against us. So, so there must be rational um, securities traders that form correct expectations of pi t plus 1 in order for this to be transmitted to actual uh, real interest rate. Yeah, you could think of it that yeah. way. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that, that will be There's fine. no such thing as a real asset, right? So in that sense... Yeah, but maybe you can assume that there is in this economy. <laughs> that, that's not quite true, right? The stocks are real assets, right? So uh, you may assume that, you know, uh, stock prices, uh, the rate of return on stocks is correct. It's given by I, I minus ET of pi T plus one. But then you have to assume that the people who do the arbitrage on stock markets um, I have an M equal to one. In let some me, sense. Yeah, right. let me give you a much simpler answer, and it's just, it doesn't matter. We yeah. can have it. We do have it. Um, this is really to follow Gabex as closely as possible. But I can show you in like three bullet points where it would show up. Okay. So now, of course, this matters for how changes in expectations are transmitted to output today, and therefore it will matter for how powerful forward guidance is. So think of forward guidance as an announcement today about an inter a one-time interest rate change, K periods in the future, or a kind of a news shock that the normal interest rate in K periods will decrease w in a one-time fashion. So what do you get? Kind of standard consumption smoothing motive. You expect the boom. You also expect high inflation expectations. And therefore, you want to smooth consumption, and you increase your consumption already today. Now, the precautionary savings motive actually decreases. Why is that? Well, what, who responds to forward guidance? These are the unconstrained households. Now, the unconstrained households, they take into account that if there's a forward guidance shock and if they become hand-to-mouth in that period, this will actually be good for them because then they will benefit even more from the future boom because they will be more exposed to this kind of, um, to the aggregate income fluctuations. And they, so therefore, they want to consume even more. However, with cognitive discounting, this is not the case. And in fact, you discount both effects. You discount the direct consumption smoothing effect, which is kind of this one here, and the precautionary savings motive, which is the second part here. And this is, for, this is why we want, want to have the precautionary savings motive, because we will also have this later on in, 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 the, in the quantitative model. And this is, for example, not the case in, in the representative H model. So the condition to kind of rule out the four guidance puzzle, if you think about um, real rate changes, then it would just be that Psi F needs to be smaller than one. If you allow for inflationary feedbacks, then you also have account for, to account for the feedback effects through inflation. And now here the M bar would show up. And you see it would be even further relaxed. So there's no forward guidance puzzle in the behavioral Hank model for basically all kind of parameterizations. Um, so we all, uh, can account for fact two. However, this is not the case with rational expectations. You see you have these kind of additional effects of forward guidance. So the forward guidance model becomes even stronger compared to the representative H model on the rational expectation, as long as you keep chi larger than one. Let me, let me show you this graphically. And I'm now going to focus on real rate shocks instead of nominal rate shocks. This is just that 
so that the line in the representative agent model is just constant at one. There are no inflationary feedback effects when there's a real rate change, and therefore, no matter when the interest rate change is imposed, nothing changes. So here we have the horizon, when it will be implemented, and here we have the time zero output response, and we say, you see it's basically one. So this is kind of the four kinds of no matter when you implement the monetary policy change, it always has the same effect on output. <coughs> now in the rational Hank model, today, has a larger effect on output than in the representative H model through these indirect effects, through kind of this redistribution to high MPC costs. <coughs> However, what you also get is a really strong forward guidance. So as the horizon increases, the response increases, and in fact goes to infinity as the horizon goes to infinity, which is not what we observe in the world. Now, this is for chi larger than one. We could counterfactually assume that chi is smaller than one, as some people have done. And then you would get a resolution of the forward guidance. You would get that the effect kind of dies out very slowly with the horizon, but then you don't have these G in, in a, an amplification mechanism or through these, these indirect effects would actually lead to a dampening. And you would have to assume that chi is smaller than one, which is now what we see. Yes? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, but this is just a comment. Whatever you're saying here holds also for ranks. Right? So if I take, uh, if I put the Gabe assumption into a rank model, would it say to you, get the same thing? If you put what? what? If I put the Gabe assumption in, in a rank model, would exactly the same. Let we know already that this is this is something that holds exactly the same also in the rank model with uh, with uh, with the Gabe uh, boundary rationality assumption. Let, right? let me show you this. So if you go to the behavioral Hank model, you see we have both. We have G amplification and K through these indirect effects. So this you would not have in the Gabex model. You would not have these indirect effects that through kind of High MCI is also more exposed. So this is really what, what you don't get in, in the GovX one. You get the, the resolution of the four guidance paths. That is true. You're even stronger because you don't have these precautionary dynamics that go against you. But you, here you see when you have these when you have both these frictions, and this this is why I think it's it's nice to, to look at the IS equation. You have these two coefficients. One determines the GE amplification, and the other one rules out the four guidance paths in the behavioral Hank model. Yes. Uh, sorry, I just want to ask you, what's the role of the anchor? You assumed it's equal to the steady state. What if it was like lagged? The lag, the we do have an extension on that. Um, is it going to amplify, dampen? It depends a little bit. Yeah, it would, it would get amplification over time. So, right, you would keep on, keep on increasing your expectations. Because that's sort of, yeah, that's sort of like a key part of like this behavioral uh, assumption. So, I don't the know how you, are you, are you discipline yeah. that. And, uh, sorry, another f following up on... Uh, on the previous question, so you, you don't have the line here for the rank, but you said that like with behavioral it would be like... It would start at one and go down. And then decrease a bit faster than the blue one. But, okay, but can you like shift it up to the up and down, moving the intertemporal elasticity of substitution? You can do that, but then the, the transmission is different, right? It would still be everything through direct effects. And yeah. what, what really is that these indirect effects are such that they amplify the increase, uh, the, the effectiveness of monetary policy. There are also papers that show, for example, that if you have more hand-to-mouth households, you get larger monetary policy responses, which is also kind of in the model exactly the same as chi larger than one. You would not have that uh, in the in the representative. Yeah, so but I'm really just saying, looking at yeah, looking at basically it, the effect of your psi c is the same as changing the intertemporal system of substitution. Yeah, exactly. Basically so psi c you, you would be one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so coming back to the, to the four facts at the beginning, we have the, the first, the second, and the third one. We have transmission through indirect effects and amplification chance, no forward guidance puzzle. And we have chi larger than one higher MPC, also also more exposed target income fluctuations. I don't have time to talk about this today, but we also show that the model is stable at the zero lower bound. We get determinacy under an interest rate pack. And the, this, the intuition is kind of similar for, as in for forward guidance. You can think of as a, the zero lower bound as a contractionary forward guidance in a sense. You cannot catch up with the interest rate, so you have kind of a contraction in monetary policy, and as the horizon increases, or the, the period of the low bound increases, you get an implode, implosion of the output gap, which is not the case in, when you have uh, the behavioral friction in there. All right, we have a couple of more results. Yes, thank you. Um, 
GE, also these indirect channels also apply to fiscal policy. This goes also back to the questions about the representative agent model. You will not have that. So we get positive consumption responses to government spending. We also look at more micro moments. In particular, we look at the intertemporal margin propensities to consume, which have been shown to be a key statistic for Hank models, and we show that we can match them. We also have an extension with sticky wages where we get interesting interactions that you get hump-shaped responses through the interaction because you get a hump shape in the real wage. And then because of the behavioral friction, the unconstrained household does not fully incorporate that when making her decisions. But then over time, she's surprised every period a little bit and therefore keeps on increasing her consumption, which gives you this hump shape of aggregate output. And we also get expectations that are in line with survey evidence, you get an initial underreaction, but a delayed overshooting, something that you would not have. Both of these effects you would not have with the representative agent and the behavioral friction. And of course, you would not have that without behavioral friction, as forecast errors would just be zero. We also nest a couple of models. You might have seen that from the IS equation. Depending on uh, what kind of frictions we turn off, we can, we can nest the textbook model, we can nest the uh, models with household heterogeneity, but also models that deviate from full information rational expectations. All right, but now let's move for the last couple of minutes to the full Hank model. And in and just one slide, this, you can think of this instead of the limited heterogeneity setup we had before as a standard incomplete market setup. We have ex ante identical households that face idiosyncratic productivity risk, endogenously binding borrower constraints, and they can only self-insure by accumulating bonds. So there is no more of this insurance within type, and they also move away from the zero liquidity equilibrium. Bounded rationality now becomes a little bit tricky because before we had, we had the steady state that you anchored your expectations to. <clears throat> now, what matters for you is where would you be absent any aggregate shock? So where would you be in the stationary equilibrium? This is what we define to be the anchor that you have. But now when there's an aggregate shock, for example, a monetary or a forward guidance shock, you expect to deviate from that stationary equilibrium counterpart, and you only discount the de expected deviation from it. So this should capture the same idea as in the tractable model. And the nice thing is that if we set M to 1, we're b back to the fully uh, standard rational Hank model, as for example, McKenna, Kummer, and Steins. But you have rational expectations over idiosyncratic risk? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, you do have rational expectations. Yeah, exactly. If there's no aggregate shock, you will, there will be no difference to the rational model. It's similar to before, because before you also understood the type switching probabilities, right? But you will, you will, if there was an aggregate shock, you, you expect to kind of deviate from the steady state. But if there's no aggregate shock, nothing happens, and the behavioral friction does not matter. And I think this is also in line with or closer uh, to the data that people or tend to underreact to macro news, but not necessarily to micro news. So this is what we try to, to uh, capture here. The calibration will follow McKenna Kumara Steins with one crucial difference, namely that we will make sure that the high MPC households are more exposed to aggregate fluctuations. And the way we do this is that high productivity households will receive a larger share of the dividend income. So it's really the same kind of channels as in the tractable model. Um, and this gives us, you can think of this as chi one. Yeah, so this is just the graph I showed you before. We get exactly the same results and exactly the same kind of tension in the rational model. You, you could resolve the four guidance puzzle, but then you don't, don't get these amplification channels, or you can get amplification, but then not the four guidance puzzle. All right, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about policy implications. So just to say, we again, we can match all these facts and also the one on fiscal policy, for example. So now let's, let's see whether this even matters, right? So far, this was a lot about resolving a tension in a mall and, and, and so on. So it doesn't matter for policy. And the experiment I want to talk about now for the last five minutes or so is we want to look at negative productivity shocks. It would be inflationary or, um, in, in a way that we, we've probably been observing over the last couple of months. And we calibrate the shocks such as potential output, which is we define it to be the um, output in the flexible representative agent rational model decreases by 1% on impact and then has some persistency, which we here set to 0 0.9. And we want to compare kind of four regimes for be the behavior and the rational model. First, we want to look at when monetary policy fully stabilizes inflation, which would be the optimal thing to do in the textbook model, right? If you have a TFP shock, you have divine coincidence. 
we want to look at that case and we want to compare it to the one where we have a sales rule. I think you need to be a little bit careful about your um, cyclicality assumption on the um, income of uh, less productive households mm -hmm. because the, the cyclicality of profits is, or profits are counter-cyclical with respect to monetary policy shocks, but not necessarily with respect to, respect to TFP shocks. That is true. So then here you might actually get into trouble because you're... Yeah, you're, no, you're that, is, that is absolutely true what you're saying. Um, the for example, the Eau Claire paper, who, where we take that fact from, also focuses on monetary policy. So this is really what we want to capture. Of course, here it's different. Now, profit income moves with the wages, right? So this is what you're saying. But conditional monetary Wh policy changes that lead to aggregate income changes. That's the exposure we want to capture. And maybe I should have been a bit more careful in, in phrasing that correctly, yeah. So just a clarifying question. Um, what's your assumption about the expectation formation for the price setters? Here they will be rational. There will be a standard Phillips uh, curve. Okay. Yeah. Just to really focus on bound rationality on the household side, which is really the focus of the paper. We do have in the tractable model, we show all the results for um, forward-looking firms, rational or behavioral, but qualitatively nothing changes. I mean, it, yeah, okay. But for here, here they will be, ra firms will be rational. Okay. So we compare these two monetary regimes, full inflation stabilization and the uh, simple Taylor rule with an uh, inflation coefficient of 1.5. And I probably won't have time to talk about that. We also look at different kind of fiscal regimes, different tax systems and the progressivity of taxes. We compare a case where only the rich pay taxes, which is what we call the progressive taxes. And then we have less progressive where every household pays according to her idiosyncratic productivity. All right, so this is what we get. We have the, the orange line is the rational model, and the blue one is the behavioral model. And if you look at that, pff, super boring, right? We get output gap is basically at zero, and inflation is exactly at zero by assumption. So this is the in full inflation stabilization case. However, to get there really matters, and then also the side effects matter. So we see that in the behavioral model, you need a much stronger increase in the normal interest rate. And the reason for this, as I said in the introduction, is really, in the rational model, people expect that the, in the interest rate will be elevated for basically for quite a long time. And now, because these expectational channels are extremely powerful in the rational model, so for example, this change in the interest rate here, like the, the deviation from zero, is extremely powerful in stabilizing inflation already today. However, this is not the case in behavioral models, so we have to act more s forcefully now. And Again, this applies in every period, this kind of reasoning, and therefore you also kind of stay elevated basically until the end. Now, when you do that, you increase the cost of government debt, which is financed partially by issuing more debt, so we get a strong increase, and in fact, if you look at higher initial debt levels, this, div this change becomes really, re really huge. And we also get a stronger increase in inequality. You see that here we look at consumption inequality, and because of the higher interest rates, wealthier households benefit more from that, and um, therefore we get a, a strong increase. Then through the tax system, we actually get a decrease in, in inequality over, over time. All right, so let me just mention um, what we find. So we find um, basically a really strong trade-off. If you compare it to the Taylor Rule case, you find that there you can actually decrease inequality, but then you get a lot of inflation in the behavioral model. So there's really this trade-off be between price stability <coughs> and kind of the side effects of fiscal sustainability and inequality. All right, um, similar findings go through for cost push shocks. Um, I don't have time to talk about an extension where we look at heterogeneity in the behavioral bias. Um, and there we find that the tax system might matter even more because when richer households are more rational, then if you have a progressive tax system, they take that fully into account and then you actually don't get a, such a strong increase in inequality. All right, so let me wrap up. We propose this kind of new framework, which we call the behavioral Hank model that can account for a large number of empirical facts about the transmission of monetary policy and highlights that there's really a strong trade of much stronger than in the rational model between price stability and fiscal sustainability and inequality. All right, that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Great. Um, many thanks, Olivier, and many thanks to the organizer for the opportunity to read this paper, uh, because it is a great take on uh, the things that we need to fix 
in all monetary models. I will start by a quick summary. Uh, Olivier did a great job uh, presenting it, so my only value added will be uh, to have a two by two matrix on the slide, which is always cool to have. Uh, so start with the representative agent rational expectation model. It's been there for a while, but it has, uh, it has lots of problems. So first thing, uh, it assumes that uh, you have permanent income households, so they have very low MPC, so you don't really get anything out of the Keynesian cross, uh, no uh, general equilibrium amplification. On top of that, uh, we know, uh, we've known for um, almost 10 years now that it runs into the forward guidance puzzles. It's a very forward looking model, so that if you do forward guidance, actually, uh, policies in the future are going to have uh, insanely huge effect. So lots of problem. And the literature has gone in two directions at the time. Uh, the first thing was to say, well, maybe if we add households heterogeneity, we can solve this. This is the Nakamura, uh, Steinson, McKay paper, uh, 2016. Uh, and so on top, if you have heterogeneity, you have higher average MPCs and you get some amplification. So great hope that you can do everything with heterogeneity. Other direction that the literature took, well, actually, if you have bounded rationality, uh, it's possible to reduce the extent of forward lookingness in the model and you can solve uh, the forward guidance puzzle this way. Obviously, that won't do anything about uh, low MPC and amplification, but you, you solve this problem. Now, it turns out that heterogeneity doesn't really work. Uh, this is Florence's paper. This is also uh, Ivan Verning's paper, etc., uh, that tells you that um, to fix the forward guidance puzzle with heterogeneity, you need additional assumption on procyclical risk, uh, and that's not really um, the, the assumption that you, you find in the data. Uh, bottom line, uh, if you want to solve all the problems, uh, you need actually both assumption, and this is uh, Olivier's paper. Uh, so they do this, and then they, they look at implications when they have this model about how to run monetary policy in this case. Uh, and they consider, for instance, if you have um, a, a cost push shock, a supply shock, uh, now you would need to increase rates much more uh, because everything that you do about the long end of the Phillips curve doesn't really have as strong an effect. Great. So I have four comments. Uh, and I will start with this one, uh, a comparison to Fari and Verning 2019. So this is Olivier's paper, is one of the, the few papers that combines those two elements, but there is one other paper uh, that does it as well. And initially, when you just read the abstract, you say, well, it looks a bit similar. So I think that you could do more to just distinguish between the two, especially because I, I really think after reading the paper that the, the two papers are not the same, and there are some, uh, some differences uh, that, are, that are worth emphasizing and things that you could do to, uh, to compare the, the two models uh, more. So uh, another two by two matrix. Basically, if you take Vary Verning, they also have those two assumptions together, but the point of the paper is to say, well, you really need both to solve the forward guidance puzzle. Uh, if you just have heterogeneity that doesn't work, if you only have bounded rationality that doesn't work, that's really the interaction that matters. Not so in Olivier's papers. In Olivier's paper, if you just have bounded rationality, that works. And heterogeneity is very important, but it's very important in order to get amplification, low MPCs, etc. For the forward guidance puzzle, um, uh, bounded rationality is enough. So why is that? There are actually two differences uh, between Olivier's, uh, Olivier's model and Fary and Verning. The first one is the way um, they model bounded rationality. Olivier explained it very well in response to a question. Uh, Fary and Verning model it at a scale level thinking so that the change in the interest rate they observe and then what they are going to discount is only the general equilibrium amplification. Here, this is following GABEX, so they discount everything, including the policy change initially. And that's the reason why you can solve the puzzle only with bounded rationality, because that already discounts uh, what monetary policy is going to do uh, later on. There is another difference, though, on top, which is that the way heterogeneity is modeled is not the same. Basically, you have um, precautionary saving, etc. Fermi and Verning actually do it with um, some kind of a trick um, so that they abstract from this. And what I would find very interesting is actually maybe you could assume that agents do observe uh, future interest rates, just like in Fairy Verning, and see whether uh, you, you get the same result that you really need both. Um, because in this case, maybe that would talk more to the interaction between the two. Uh, perfect. So th this is the suggestion here. Comment number three, uh, we'll come back to the idea why I think it's a good, maybe a good uh, extension to look at what happens if you observe nominal interest rate. But let me uh, move to comment number two before. Uh, I apologize to everyone, it's going to be a bit, a bit nerdy, a bit technical, but um, I, I think it's important 
uh, to emphasize this point, uh, which is that in the GABase frameworks, uh, it's actually surprisingly tricky to deal with endogenous state variables. And here you have a model, at least in the uh, numerical uh, um, extension, where, where you have um, positive uh, liquidity uh, in equilibrium. In this model, you do have endogenous state variables. And if you can handle those, uh, that's actually a great contribution of the paper that you, can, uh, that you can emphasize. But right now in the paper, it's not very clear how to do this. So let me just emphasize a bit the problem here which is that basically the GABEX approach tells you when you have a future variables, you're going to discount that. So whenever you have an expectation of something t plus one, you put an M bar in front of that. And uh, in Olivier's paper, they say, well, we, we can do it for any variable. Turns out it cannot really be true. Uh, just take this silly example. If you have a variable Z1, uh, you define Z1 plus alpha uh, Z1 at t minus one. Uh, then if you, you cannot apply it to both Z2 and Z1. Uh, this is just a silly uh, way to show it. In this case, you would apply it to Z1. Uh, and then for uh, uh, ZT1, uh, you wouldn't apply any discounting. So it cannot be that you apply it to both. So there's really an issue here. It sounds like a quibble. And it turns out that in a purely forward-looking model, it is. Uh, you can find simple rule to, uh, about what variables to apply it to. But once you have endogenous state variables, uh, it becomes really an issue. So here is a simple example. If you have a purely forward-looking monetary model with a Phillips curve and a Euler equation, then you have that you can apply this to everything and that the expectation of inflation is going to be just discount the discounted uh, version of the rational expectation of inflation tomorrow. But if you have instead the new Keynesian Phillips curve plus a nominal spending rule, then it's a model with an endogenous state variable. And in this case, this does not apply. So once you have endogenous state variable, it's become a tricky issue. And that would be great if you could do more to, to see how to handle those in such a model. OK, comment number three. I'm going to come back to this assumption of whether you assume future monetary policy or not. Uh, so this is the aggregate demand block in Olivier's paper. And you see that, as Olivier mentioned, it, you discount everything. You discount all the general equilibrium implication on inflation, but you also discount the policy itself. And this has important implication in the model. This means that basically agents discount the very policy uh, tomorrow. And this is very important for the policy implication. Uh, this is what is going to imply that um, monetary policy uh, tomorrow doesn't have such an impact. So you need to increase rates more today if you want to reach uh, the same impact on inflation. Now, maybe you could do more to just check this expectation in the data. So here is an example uh, just Looking at the yield curve in the US, I will tell you in a minute why I'm doing it for, for the US. And as you know, it has changed a lot in the past year. If I look at it uh, last summer, it was uh, very low and slowly rising, but now it's much higher. And as you can see here, not only change in the low end of the Phillips curve, but there are quite some substantial changes at the long end of the Phillips curve as well. So it looks like monetary policy in the US, the Fed was able to move the entire yield curve and not only uh, the, the short end. Obviously, we can say, well, it doesn't prove anything. Maybe uh, they should have changed their expectation about the long run even more. But at least if you look at the dot plots of the Fed, that's the reason why I focus on the US, it looks that they agree. Broadly speaking, uh, the yield curve that um, Fed officials were uh, communicating uh, last summer was quite similar to the one that markets were expecting. And today, same thing, uh, the expectations for, for rates that expect both at the short end and the long run is about the same. So to this extent, it doesn't seem like at least financial markets uh, really discounted something relative to what uh, Fed's official was saying. And what markets expect is actually what matters the most uh, for, for the transmission of monetary policy. Uh, so again, coming back to, to comment uh, number one, uh, that would be interesting to do, also look at the model if you make this assumption that you do observe uh, rates in the, uh, that you do observe nominal rates, but that you discount only the general equilibrium implication. Okay, so final uh, comment number four. I'm just gonna ask Olivier to, uh, to, to help me do my job here. After reading the paper, I was just asking myself, well, uh, that's a paper with an important policy implication that tells you, well, you need actually to increase rates more uh, to fight the, the current uh, infl uh, inflationary shocks. So very timely on top uh, of very relevant. But ultimately, I wasn't sure whether you know, I need to go to the next preparation of uh, the governing council and say, actually, we, we thought about it. We, we need to update our recommendation, and we need to increase rates more. So why, it's, why is it so? 
the ultimately uh, the the best guess that we can form on the impact of a monetary policy shock of an increase in interest rates uh, is going to be informed by a, uh, a theoretical models. So, so we take it from uh, the the literature on the identification of on monetary policy shocks, and we don't really need a model here. Then Olivier's model is going to say, well, if you just take this this row estimate of the impact of a shock, you need to change the composition of the the part of this shock that went through the change in the long end of the Phillips curve uh, and the part that went through the short end. So you need to reassess and say, well, it goes mostly through the short end, the long, the long end, uh, not so much. And if you were, but the thing is, ultimately, the, um, the overall impact needs to match what we find in a, a theoretical model. So the model is going to change a bit this decomposition, but if you were to estimate it, I would expect that if you estimate a rank model under rational expectation, and if you estimate your model uh, with bounded rationality and heterogeneity, it will give you different estimates for the parameters. So ultimately, the overall impact of the monetary policy shock would be the same. It will only change uh, the channels of transmission. So uh, that could be interesting if you, would, if, you, if you were to estimate the model and see whether you really get uh, this implication that you need to increase rates more, or if not, uh, maybe change a bit uh, the, the way you phrase this recommendation. So I'm done. Thanks again. Uh, great paper. Uh, and it was a pleasure, Renneke. Uh, yes, so in a Hank and uh, in a Hank plus search and matching uh, model, you have like an amplification of general of uh, TFP shocks uh, because of uh, like a precautionary saving uh, motive. So like you expect a higher probability to be unemployed tomorrow. So you're going to increase saving today, decrease consumption, and decrease output today. But the problem, it seems that with your connective bias, you're going to decrease this amplification effect of a uh, uh, pre precautionary saving uh, uh, motive. Any more questions? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, my feeling is the results uh, you showed, at least the quantitative part, depends a lot of the calibration of the M bar parameter, right? And I, I understood it was upper bound uh, was found to be 0.85, which to me seems a lot of discounting if, if, if it's a quarterly uh, model, right? So so I, I wonder if you have um, imp um, strong empirical evidence behind, behind that or some sensitivity of what, uh, what if you, you have lower dis discounting. Let's take two more questions and then we give Oliver the opportunity to respond. Uh, thanks, Olivier. Uh, Oliver, uh, great paper. Um, just one comment related to Hervé. Um, obviously, in this model, we would like to endogenize M, right? But it's very difficult with this uh, setup. Um, I know one paper that uh, did it uh, is a representative agent model. Uh, is an Oxford student, a <laughs> previous student of mine, uh, so a bit of uh, promotion of, uh, of a PhD student. Uh, uh, what he shows is that a lot of results changes. And it shows also that when you, if you want to estimate this model, which I think is a very good suggestion, the M parameter is uh, not very well identified because, uh, but but that's the, you know is the idea of uh, rational attention that should be endogenous and depending uh, you know, optimally from uh, model parameters. While I walk over to Francesca, I'll advertise an own paper of mine that does exactly that, where we, <laughs> <laughs> where we endogenize the attention you want to pay to the state of the economy as a function of your own wealth. So the heterogeneity there uh, plays a strong role. Have a look at my website. So thanks, great presentation. So my question is on the concept of potential output. So if I understood correctly, you define it as a flex price under uh, rank. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering a little bit why, because, you know, I especially if you are going to estimate or, you know, to consider several shocks, the definition of potential output obviously will, will matter. Thanks a lot. Okay, should I respond? Okay. Thanks, everyone, for great questions, and thanks, Stefan, for a very insightful discussion. Um, so <laughs> let me go through backwards. So potential output, we had to take a stand on how we define it. We could also take the potential output in the Hank model, and the results would, would be exactly the same. So you actually saw that the output gap goes slightly above zero, and this has exactly to do with the definition of the potential output. If you would take the hang potential output, it would be exactly at zero. So the differences are, are, are quite small there. Um, thanks for mentioning James' paper. I, I, I've seen it. The last two conferences I was at, I was in the same session as he was. So um, 
That's a great paper, and this is definitely something uh, I want to think about more going forward. Um, but yeah, and also the paper by Tobias is, is yeah, it was on the slide. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the empirical evidence for M equal to 0 0.85, we provide kind of direct evidence where we look at these Koibion Gorodnichenko regressions on a quarterly basis, and you find that there you have this underreaction. And you can, there's a, a way to translate this into the M bar, where we account for, where we, the data is, is about one year ahead expectations, but there you can transform that to quarterly, and then we find something. It, sometimes we even find values of 0 0.5. If you look at unemploy expected unemployment changes, it is way lower than, than 0 0.85. There are other ways. There are um, papers that estimate the S equations and estimate the kind of the discounting in front of the expected output, they also find values about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and so on. So I think this is not a crazy assumption, but yeah, we could definitely look at, like, I mean, we can freely play around with the parameter and see where, is there kind of a threshold where it starts mattering or not? And we haven't done that. Um, search and matching frictions. Um, yeah, it's true, you get these, these amplification channels. What they also show is that they have the exactly the same problem than the, 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 the rational Hank model, that for a Gaines puzzle uh, becomes extreme, Taylor principle does not hold anymore, so you get a lot of instability at the lower bound, for example. Um, I agree that there, the, the, the behavioral friction would also, would also play in. I'm not 100% sure how, how that would look like. Um, yeah, so the, to the discussion, um, let me see. So one thing that, that kind of, I think what was the key point is that trying to keep expectations about that people understand uh, the interest rate path going forward, we could easily do that because we do the decomposition in direct and indirect effects or we distinguish between what comes through changes in income and what comes through changes in the interest rate. Um, we haven't done it. But I think it would be quite, at least in the tractable model, it would be super simple to do, and we should definitely look into that, yeah. Um, estimating the model, um, yeah, I think in order to get a good kind of empirical fit, we would need a lot of bells and whistles um, to be able, um, yeah, so this is definitely something we could, we could do. Um, Probably not with the exact framework we have now, but with these kind of interactions would be super interesting to look at. Um, the Gobex framework about the endogenous state variables, I have to think about it, but what we do in the, in the so as you said correctly, in the tractable model, it doesn't matter because you don't have any endogenous states. As, you, as we go to the quantitative model there, it's, it's about the deviations from the stationary equilibrium of the margin utility. That is what matters. So it's not directly about the individual components, but about the margin utility that is discounted. But I'm not right, happy. But the marginal utility will depend on the states. And exactly, the but yeah, states. but exactly, but it will not like the bonds you have will be the same as in the stationary equilibrium, where you would be given your individual state, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only the, the expected deviation from that that you would discount. Okay. I, I okay. Yeah. Still <laughs> some some things that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Definitely. I. I. Yeah. I have to. Yeah. Have to think about it more.